Good evening. It's good to be with you again this evening. It's a rather wintry day here in Portland, but uh, my office is nice and cozy and warm, and I'm looking forward to sharing God's Word with you tonight. Thursday is Thanksgiving, so I thought I'd begin just by reading the second half of Psalm 100, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loyal love is everlasting, his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the technology that allows us to be together, even though we're in different locales. We're grateful, Lord, for your word, for your divinely inspired and inerrant word that teaches us about you and how uh, we uh, can honor you by our lives and by our actions here on this earth. We're thankful for the book of Ezekiel tonight. Guide us as we seek to understand his message and then as we consider the new covenant. And we'll give you the thanks and the praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Ezekiel, he might be best remembered as the prophet of pantomime. You know, many of the prophets use symbolic actions as a vehicle for their divine revelation. Isaiah walked around naked for three years, as is recorded in Isaiah 20. Jeremiah wore a wooden yoke around his neck. And Hosea married a wife of whoredom. <laughs> so all of these were symbolic actions, but Ezekiel excelled them all in his use of symbolic action. You see, he was a priest by his upbringing and training, and symbolic action associated with the temple was second nature to him especially symbolism that combined words and deeds. For Ezekiel, the prophet, everything had a message, and his dramatic actions, always combined with his words, were a powerful means of communicating God's truth to the people in captivity. The actions that he carried out were especially significant because Ezekiel was mute. He couldn't speak for the first seven and a half years of his ministry. He could never say, honey, what's uh, new in the Jerusalem times, or pass me another piece of that unleavened bread. <laughs> Ezekiel couldn't speak except when the Lord spoke through him. The only thing Ezekiel could say for those first seven and a half years of ministry was, thus says the Lord, and then he would give a prophecy. To carry on his ministry, he would walk around the city center and do a little play acting, a pantomime. And the people would gather around him and say, hmm, what's the prophet Ezekiel up to today? And then later Ezekiel would complete the symbolic action and return to his home. And sometime later in the afternoon, the elders of the city would come to his house and say, oh, Ezekiel, what is God saying to us today? In other words, what's the meaning and the significance of your symbolic action? What's God telling us through your symbolic action? So that's the, the story on Ezekiel. Let's get acquainted with the book that he wrote as we consider the facts on Ezekiel. Well, the author is Ezekiel. His name means God strengthens. He was a contemporary of Daniel, who ministered in Babylon in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, and Jeremiah, who prophesied in Jerusalem. As to the date of writing, his last dated prophecy is 570 B.C. Regarding the historical setting, Ezekiel was the son of a Zadokite priest and was deported to Babylon by king, uh, at the time of uh, King Jehoiachin, along with about 10,000 Judeans who were taken into captivity in the year 597 B.C. And so he lived there in Babylon among a colony of exiles at a place called Tel Aviv, not the modern Tel Aviv in Israel, but a Tel Aviv located about 50 miles south of the city of Babylon. And from 593, when he was taken into captivity, until 586, Ezekiel's ministry con consisted primarily of announcing judgment. God's going to judge Judah. After the fall of Jerusalem, his message changed. And he offered a message of consolation, predicting the future restoration of Jerusalem and the temple. So as you recall from our study of Israel's history, there were three captivities. Daniel was taken with his friends in 605 BC. Ezekiel was taken with the 10,000 Judeans in 597. 
and then the remnant of Israel, the last little group, was taken in 586. Jeremiah refers to that last remnant as the good figs. They're taken out of Jerusalem because Jerusalem is going to be destroyed and all the people that remain there. So Ezekiel is ministering to the group that was taken in the second captivity in 597 BC. The purpose of his book is to show that Jerusalem's destruction was on account of the sins of the nation. This discipline was designed to bring them to a knowledge that Yahweh is God. He is the true God, the God of Israel. And the prophecy is also intended to comfort the people through God's promise of future restoration and blessing. Even though God announces judgment through Ezekiel, he says, God's not through with you, and God will restore you, and eventually the temple will be rebuilt, and Messiah will rule and reign from that temple. So there's a message of hope here. The theme of the book is the destruction and future restoration of Jerusalem and the temple. Lots about the temple, especially in chapters 40 through 48. Ezekiel makes a distinctive contribution to biblical theology by emphasizing the glory of the Lord. The vision which introduces Ezekiel's call left him with an abiding sense of God's glory. And over and over again, he mentions the glory of God. So that's a very prominent theme in the book of Ezekiel, the glory of the Lord. The book divides into three main parts. Chapters 1 through 3, we see his call and commissioning. And he has this amazing vision in chapter 1 that is associated with his call. And then in chapters 4 through 32, we see Ezekiel's symbolic actions as he acts out these various little dramas that contain a message that God has for the people. And finally, he concludes his book in chapters 33 through 48 <clears throat> with a prophecy concerning Israel's future, that there is a future and a hope for the people of Israel. So, with these big sweeping sections in mind, let's look at his call and commissioning in chapters 1 through 3. As we begin this section, just a little background on visions. In the time of the 6th century, it was very popular to have what is called a dream vision. And these have been recorded by ancient writers, and Ezekiel's visions follow the same pattern as these other visions that were contemporary with him in Babylon. And the vision usually begins with a setting, description of the setting, and then a description of the vision itself, followed by an interpretation of the vision. Since God is the master communicator, he's going to use the same media of instruction that we find going on in Babylon and in his day, these dream visions. So God is going to give Ezekiel a dream vision so that the people can understand the message that he has for them. And we'll first see the setting, the vision itself, and the interpretation. So the setting of the vision, where was Ezekiel? He is in Babylon. In fact, he's located about 50 miles south of Babylon in this little community called Tel Aviv. And Ezekiel was there at this time. And so then after describing his setting in Tel Aviv, he goes on to tell us about the vision itself. And uh, he sees this, this cloud. And out of this cloud, he sees lightning flashing. And as he looks further into this cloud and he sees this, this vision, this night vision, he sees more things going on. He sees some wheels. He sees some living creatures within the wheels. Four wheels, four living creatures, and these creatures could go in any direction, forward, sideways, and the creatures followed along with the wheels. He calls them living creatures. And then in verse 22, he says that over the heads of these living creatures was something like an expanse of crystal. And this uh, artist's conception communicates that. And then over that expanse of something like crystal, he saw something like a throne, a beautiful marine color. He calls it a lapis lazuli color. And then there's a figure on the throne, and a beautiful rainbow surrounds the throne. And Ezekiel tells us about this vision here in chapter 1. 
he says the appearance of the rainbow and the clouds was like the clouds on a rainy day um, such a radiance was this beautiful vision well now Ezekiel has told us about the vision the pattern for dream visions is first to tell us of the setting then record the vision and finally give us the interpretation so what's your interpretation of Ezekiel's vision this uh, this scene with these living creatures and these wheels and this throne and someone sitting on the throne you know there's just about as many commentaries written on Ezekiel's vision as there are on any other thing in scripture and there's a lot of speculation that goes on in trying to suggest what are the meanings for example of the eyes on the wheel but Ralph Alexander one of my colleagues has written his doctoral dissertation on the interpretation of ancient visions and here's what he suggests by way of guidelines he says first of all look for the interpretation that is provided in the text he points out that oftentimes the text itself will interpret the vision so look for that interpretation second point he makes is don't add to the interpretation if one is given in the text if there's an interpretation in the text then that should be sufficient for us and don't try to look at beyond that interpreting a lot of details that aren't uh, necessarily relevant to what the divine interpreter has, has given us and <clears throat> then don't interpret the minute details of the vision the fact that there's eyes on the wheels uh, maybe that's significant maybe it's not but there's nothing in the text that describes them or says that they are significant so look for the interpretation in the text don't add to the interpretation that is given and don't interpret the minute details so we go back to Ezekiel chapter 1 and what's the interpretation of this vision that is provided for us in the text well if we look at verse 1 Ezekiel tells us that uh, his eyes were opened and the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God so that's what Ezekiel saw. I saw visions of God and then notice in verse 28 he adds this such was the likeness of the glory of the Lord so what Ezekiel is telling us here is that this is a vision of the glory of the Lord that's all he says it doesn't give us the significance of the wheels or why they go sideways and forwards or the eyes on the wheel or the meaning of lapis lazuli on the throne he doesn't give all that but what he does in this vision is, is seen in verse 28 when I saw it I fell on my face and heard a voice in other words he didn't try to figure out what everything meant he fell before the Lord in an act of worship and listened for what the Lord had to say to him sometimes I think we read a vision like this and we want to interpret all these details and I think instead we ought to respond as Ezekiel did falling on our face in an act of worship and then waiting for the Lord to reveal his his truth to us so Ezekiel's vision it's a vision of the glory of God and it was the vision that attracted him to to God and uh, and was the basis for his call to ministry now we see his commissioning and in chapter 2 verse 8 he is told to eat this book he's given this this book this scroll and he's to eat it and on it we find are written the words lamentation mourning and woe so what does that tell us about the message of, of that he's going to proclaim well it's a message of judgment lamentation mourning and woe and he's to take this message and as it were digest it and then communicate it to the people of Israel he's to make this message his own and then he's to communicate it to the mess to the people of Israel to speak to the people of Israel this rebellious people a message of lamentation mourning and woe and what he's going to tell them is that judgment is coming for Jerusalem Jerusalem is going to be destroyed Ezekiel is also uh, to be a watchman chapter 3 verse 17 says son of man I've appointed you a watchman now a watchman in ancient times would have a watch tower or perhaps the watchman would be up on the city gate and they would watch over the city is there a caravan approaching that we can go out and sell our goods to or buy some goods 
or is there an ancient army approaching that might attack us and so we need to close the gate? Well, the watchman was keeping track on what was going on and warning the people if danger was approaching. And so that's the kind of ministry Ezekiel is going to have. He's going to be a watchman on a watchtower, watching over the city, watching over the people, warning them of danger should they uh, fall into sin. But Ezekiel was going to have a very unusual ministry as described at the end of chapter 3, for we find that he's to live secluded in his house rather than uh, walking about and traveling from city to city as uh, prophets often did. He's to be secluded in his house. 3 verse 24, shut yourself up in your house. And then verse 25, he's to be bound with ropes. Son of man, they will put ropes on you and bind you with them. So you cannot go out with, with him, among them. So he's going to be bound with ropes. Some question as to whether that is to be understood literally or figuratively. But then in verse uh, 26, we also see your tongue will stick to the roof of your mouth so that you will be mute and uh, not cannot be a man who rebukes them. So he's going to be mute. <laughs> How's that? A prophet who can't speak. How's he going to speak for God if he can't speak? Well, Ezekiel is going to be a prophet of pantomime. He's going to be acting out symbolically the judgments that are going to be coming upon his people. So here we see the prophet is commissioned. He's to be secluded in his house. He's to be in some way bound so that he can't go out and mingle among the people, and he's going to be mute. The only time Ezekiel is going to be able to speak is when God speaks through him. So a very different kind of ministry as a prophet. Well, let's take a look then at some of these symbolic actions that Ezekiel was to act out. And the first one, he's instructed in chapter 4 to go and get a brick and inscribe on that brick the name Jerusalem. Could have been a mud brick or a clay brick. But he gets this brick and he writes the name Jerusalem on it. And then he's instructed to uh, build a siege against this brick. And the idea here is that Jerusalem is going to come under siege. It's going to come under siege by the Babylonians. They're going to surround the city, and they're going to siege, besiege the city uh, and eventually destroy it. So Jerusalem is going to come under siege. There's some debate as to the significance of the iron plate that Ezekiel is to set between himself and the city. And uh, is that iron plate some kind of a symbol of the hardness of the judgment or the protection that God will give the prophet. You know, we don't know. The text doesn't explain the significance of the iron plate. But we do know the message is about Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is going to come under siege. So that makes it, that, that's, that is clear. The significance of the iron plate is not, is not revealed. Jerusalem's going to come under siege by the Babylonians, and it happened, even as Ezekiel predicted in 586 B.C. And then we see the sign of the prophet's posture. Ezekiel is instructed to lie on his left side 390 days, and then to lie on his right side 40 days, for a total of 430 days. He's to lie on one side and then the other. Now, we don't know if he would lay on, on his side uh, 24 hours a day, or 6 hours a day, or a couple of hours a day. Uh, the text doesn't tell us that. But it does indicate that uh, this is a period of judgment. And so between 597, when Ezekiel went into captivity, and 430, when the Maccabees liberated Judea from oppression by the Syrians, during that period, we find that Israel was under judgment until, until 167 BC, uh, until, until, uh, and uh, 430 years, a total of 430 years, until 167 BC, which was the time the Maccabees liberated the people from Syrian rule. So for 400, each day represents a year. For 430 years, there would be judgment from 597 to 167, a total of 430 years of judgment. The next message has to do with famine. And in chapter 4, verses 9 through 17, we see that uh, Ezekiel is, is commanded to make some bread 
with just a little bit of, of wheat and a little bit of beans and a little bit of barley and all these different ingredients because there's not going to be enough of anything when the city of Jerusalem goes under famine. This speaks of the meager portions that the people will have during the time of the famine in Jerusalem. And then he's commanded to do something very disgusting. He's to bake this bread using human excrement as fuel for his oven. <laughs> disgusting. Um, and Ezekiel, who's uh, been trained as a priest, knows that this would be a very defiling thing. And he says, Lord, this is just too much. And he says, uh, please uh, let me use something else. And God grants him that and graciously says, you can cook over animal dung rather than human dung. And so the fire is going to be fueled by animal dung. What's the point here? Well, the Judeans would soon be eating unclean food in a foreign land, and there wouldn't be enough of it. It would be a time of famine for these Judeans. So this was a strong warning of the coming judgment. The next one we see is in chapter 5, and here we see the sign of the knife and the razor. Ezekiel is told to cut his hair, <laughs> to shave his head, and he divides the hair into three parts. One-third is to be burned with fire, one-third is to be hacked up with a sword, and another third is to be scattered to the wind. And the interpretation of the vision is uh, given to us here in uh, verse 12, chapter 5, verse 12, where he says, one-third of you will die by plague and be consumed or be consumed by famine. One-third will fall by the sword, and one-third will be scattered to every wind. Uh, so one-third is to be scattered, and that would be the group that goes into captivity. But notice, notice that God instructs Ezekiel to take a few of those hairs and bind them into his robe and preserve a few of those hairs. And what we see here is the promise that a remnant will be preserved. A third of the hair will be burned, a third cut up, a third scattered, but there will be a few that are preserved. And this is the beginning of Ezekiel's teaching about a remnant. And this remnant is going to be the basis for the Jews who return from captivity. And eventually, out of that remnant comes a Galilean Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. He comes out of the remnant. In chapter 6, we see the sign of clapping. We usually think of clapping in a positive sense. We're clapping because we appreciate someone's music or singing. But in this particular case, in chapter 6, clapping is more of a striking and beating rather than an applause. And striking one's hands was an expression of scorn and ridicule in ancient times. So rather than seeing this in a positive light, slapping his hands or striking his hands is a sign of judgment and a sign of, of the judgment that's going to come upon Ju Judah and that uh, this Jew is going to be scorned and ridiculed in the judgment that will come upon them for rejecting uh, God's prophets and for breaking the covenant. We move on into chapter 7 and we see the sign of the chain. And uh, here you see a chain with a ball on it and it's an emblem of coming captivity. The people of Judah are going to be bound with chains. In 586 they're going to be taken off to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, bound with chains as slaves and taken off to, to Babylon. So this is a sign in chapter 7 of coming judgment. Now the end is upon you, he says. Uh, a disaster is coming, unique uh, disaster. The end is coming, the end has come, and he shows them this chain. And uh, the people are going to be taken off into captivity as slaves. You might be wondering at this particular point, why is God going to do all this to his people in Judah? What have they done that's been so so bad? Well, I think we, we find that in chapter 8, where we have a vision of Ezekiel's, of uh, Jerusalem's idolatry. And Ezekiel is in Babylon, but he is taken by vision to the Jerusalem temple. So physically he's in Babylon, but uh, it's like he has uh, 
uh, vision into Jerusalem and what is actually happening there in, in Jerusalem. And he sees idolatry. People are worshiping idols there right at the gate of the temple. It's a horrible thing that they're doing. And this idol at the gate of the temple is provoking God to jealousy. And then uh, he, he looks into the court of the temple and he sees women weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was the lover of Ishtar, the Babylonian god of vegetation. And so we see more uh, uh, idolatry going on. And so uh, in verse 14, you see the idolatry that is going on right there at the Jerusalem temple. But it even gets worse. It even gets worse than this. And Ezekiel is told, you'll see a greater abomination than this. And he's taken into the court where the priests are to officiate in the temple. And he sees people there, the priests, they're putting, they're worshiping Shamash the sun and putting the twig to their nose. It says they're putting the twig to their nose. They're worshiping the sun. And worshiping the sun, you'd be facing east where the sun rises. And if you're facing east where the sun rises, your backs are going to be to the Jerusalem temple and to the altar of the Lord. In other words, these priests are worshiping the suns and putting their rear ends in the face of God and his holy temple. That's pretty bad. And then he says they're putting the twig to their nose. We don't know the, the ultimate significance of this, but it seems to be a literary disguise for something too obscene to describe. And you can only imagine the kinds of things that were going on uh, there uh, among the priests in this idolatrous place as they're worshiping idols in the very temple of the Lord. Something too obscene for us to even read about. So they're saying they're putting the twig to their nose. Well, you can imagine that the Lord is not pleased. And in the next section, in verses in chapters 9 through 11, we see the departure of the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is going to leave Jerusalem. God can no longer allow his reputation to be associated with this idolatrous place. And so in chapters 9, 10, and 11, we see the departure of the glory of the Lord from Jerusalem. The glory of the Lord went up from the cherubim, where it had been there in the, in the temple, and goes out to the threshold of the temple. And then the glory of the Lord leaves that in chapter 10 and goes out to the east gate. And then the, the, the glory of the Lord goes from the east gate out to the mountain that is east of Jerusalem. And what God is saying, he says, I'm removing my glorious reputation from Jerusalem because Jerusalem has violated the covenant and is going to be judged. In chapter 12, we see the sign of the baggage. And whenever you pack your bags, it means you're going somewhere. And so what Ezekiel does on one fine day is to pack his bags as a sign that these uh, Judeans are going to be going into captivity. The sign is actually for the benefit of the people in exile, already there in exile, but Ezekiel is doing this to say what's going to happen in Jerusalem. Pack your bags, you people in Jerusalem, because you're going into exile. And so the bags are packed, and Ezekiel uh, goes out from his house as a picture of the coming captivity and exile. Chapter 12, verses 17 through 20, we see the sign of the bread and water. And he's told to eat his bread and drink his water with trembling and anxiety. And it's a picture of the coming siege of Jerusalem, where there's not going to be much to eat or much to drink when the Babylonians surround the city. And Nebuchadnezzar came to the city of Jerusalem in 588, um, uh, and for a year and a half he besieged the city until it finally captured the city and destroyed the temple. And during that long siege, people were eating bread and water with trembling and anxiety, knowing that the end was near. Chapter 21, we see the sign of the signpost. And Ezekiel uh, has a vision of Nebuchadnezzar coming to a junction. And on this junction, at this junction, there's a signpost. And one sign says, to Amman, which is in Jordan. And the other says, to Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And he divines which is the place to go first. 
and uh, through divination he decides to go to Jerusalem first. Jerusalem's going to be captured first, then he'll come back later and deal with Amman in Amman, Jordan. But uh, this is another indication that Jerusalem's end is near. One of the most tragic of the symbolic actions of Ezekiel is the is the death of his wife and that he is not allowed to mourn the death of his wife. And we read about this in chapter 24. He is told that Ezekiel is told that his his wife is going to be taken from him. Son of man, behold, verse 16, I'm about to take the desire of your eyes with a blow, and you shall not mourn. You shall not weep. Your tears shall not come. Groan silently, but make no mourning for the dead. Whew. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? He's not even to, allowed to mourn the death of his wife. Why no mourning? Why is he not allowed to mourn the death of his wife? Well, I've wondered about that, and I think there's no mourning because this is God's judgment. You can't complain when God is doing something that's just. And since the Israelites uh, had not mourned the idolatry in Jerusalem, and uh, so Ezekiel is not to mourn the judgment on Jerusalem, symbolized by the death of his wife. This was a hard one. This was no doubt the hardest of his symbolic actions to endure, to have his wife die and not even to be able to mourn her. We come to the end of chapter 24, and we find that Ezekiel uh, is no longer mute. A message comes that Jerusalem has been uh, captured, and it's being destroyed. And at this point, Ezekiel is freed from his being mute and is able to speak a message of encouragement, a message of hope uh, to the people. Um, on that day, it's announced in verse 27, your mouth will be opened and you will speak and be no longer mute, and thus you shall be assigned to them, and they'll know that I'm the Lord. With the destruction of Jerusalem, Ezekiel is now going to be able to speak words of comfort, words of hope, words of encouragement to the Judeans. And so his message is going to change here from a message of judgment to a message of consolation and encouragement. God isn't desirous for the judgment just to continue forever. He wants to encourage the people with the promise that there's a new day coming, a better day coming, and Ezekiel is going to announce that um, uh, in the future. It's in chapter 33 that we make a transition now to the discussion of Israel's future. And here in chapters 33 through 48, we find some promises that God made for his people about the future. And the first one is that Israel will be restored to national life. We see that revealed in chapter 37. Israel is going to be restored to national life. Even though they were taken off into Babylonian captivity, they're going to be restored. But even better, Israel will become a spiritual and regenerate people. Chapter 36 is going to talk about the new covenant and how the people of, of Judah are going to enter into a new covenant in, in uh, that's going to be different from the old covenant which they broke. And then third, the enemies of Israel are going to be judged and destroyed. Two major chapters in chapters 38 and 39 describe the Gog-Magog campaign or battle and how this results in the destruction of Judah's enemies. And they're going to be judged and destroyed. Well, Ezekiel has some more promises. And the next promise is that Israel will be regathered to their land. Even though they were taken off into captivity, God's people Israel are going to be brought back to their land, regathered to their land. And then we discover in chapter uh, uh, 37 that the, the two nations, Israel and Judah, are going to be united under one king. That king, of course, is going to be the Messiah, but the two nations are going to be gathered together again, united under one king. You recall that the northern kingdom went into captivity to Assyria. The southern kingdom went into captivity to Babylon. And the northern kingdom never came back, although the southern kingdom was restored. But here we find that both kingdoms are going to be brought back, united together, and they're going to worship and serve one king, the Messiah. 
last messianic worship will be established including temple sacrifices and this raises a lot of problems and we're going to talk about the problem of temple sacrifices a little bit later. Well this is a uh, prophetic scenario that Ezekiel uh, reveals and yet there's a lot of debate about it. A lot of theologians debate exactly how these promised events are going to be fulfilled. John Walford was the president of Dallas Seminary for many years and I believe he gives us a helpful perspective on prophecy with these words. I believe Christ is coming and the bottom line in life is how you meet him. All these other details are immaterial. Well that's a good perspective on it. There are a lot of details that people debate but ultimately those details are immaterial if you're not prepared for the coming of the Messiah Jesus. And I trust you all are prepared for the return of Jesus and your hearts are looking forward to that great day of Jesus' return. That's the most important thing. But we need to go back to some of these promises and uh, see if we can understand them a little better. So I'm going to highlight a few of these and in chapter 34 we have a message concerning the shepherds of Israel. The leaders of Israel are likened to sheep or shepherds, shepherds that are responsible for their sheep. And we often find this imagery in scripture of God as the shepherd, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Isaiah 40 verse 11 also uses this shepherd imagery. So God can be a shepherd. Human leaders can also be depicted as shepherds. And so here we see the shepherds of Israel are the leaders that have been responsible to care for the flock, but they've, they failed to do so. And as a result, God is going to replace them, and he's going to take over the ministry of shepherding the people. The human shepherds are going to be set aside, and God is going to shepherd his flock and care for his his people. This is a beautiful text and I believe one of the best texts in scripture on pastoral ministry. So in chapter 34 what do we learn about pastoral ministry from the way God says he's going to replace these wicked shepherds and he'll be the shepherd of his people. He says in verse 2 of chapter 34 that he's going to judge these shepherds who have been feeding themselves Shouldn't shepherds feed the flock? Uh, he says, you eat the fat, clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened, those diseased you have not healed, the broken you have not bound up, the scattered you have not brought back, nor have you sought the lost, but with fierce and severity have you dominated them. Well there you have a negative description of these leaders who should have been caring for the flock and ministering the flock and they've neglected to do so. So God says I'm going to set them aside. I'm going to set them aside and the Lord says I will become the shepherd for my people. He says I will bring them out, of, uh, bring out the people and I will feed them, verse 13, and I will feed them in a good pasture and uh, they'll lie down on good grazing ground. I'll feed my flock and lead them to rest. I'll seek the lost and bring back the scattered. Boy, what a picture of pastoral ministry. Feeding the lost, uh, seeking the lost, uh, caring for the scattered, for the sick, for the hungry, for the needy. That's a picture of pastoral ministry. I know that many of you are aspiring to be pastors. and This is a great text to reflect on in terms of pastoral ministry. In chapter 36, Ezekiel talks about the restoration of the nation and the establishment of a new covenant to replace the one that the people broke. And this is Ezekiel's version of the new covenant. We'll look at this in greater detail in Jeremiah 31, but here he promises that the people will experience forgiveness and cleansing from sin. Boy, that's a good news. They'll experience spiritual rebirth, getting a new heart. The Holy Spirit is going to come and indwell them, and they're going to be empowered for godly living because the Spirit indwells them and they'll experience a vital relationship with God. All of these provisions, forgiveness of sin, spiritual rebirth, the indwelling ministry of the Spirit, the empowerment for godly living, 
all of this is based on the cross of Christ. All of this is based upon what Jesus did for us at the cross. All of these are blessings that are freely given as a result of the new covenant in Jesus' blood. In chapter 37, Ezekiel is told to prophesy over some dry bones. The dry bones you see here are the bones of the monks at the uh, monastery there at the foot of Mount Sinai, St. Catherine's Monastery. And, uh, they bury the dead, but then they bring out the bones and put them in a big room. They call it the charnel house, the place where the bones are, 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 are left. And so you see all these dry bones. And Ezekiel is given a vision of these dry bones, and then he's asked, can these bones live? Chapter 11, of course, Ezekiel says, I don't know. I don't know where they can or not. But then he's told to prophesy over these bones. O oh, dry bones, chapter 37, verse 4, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, I will call breath to enter you that you may come to life. And what we have here is a resurrection, but it takes place in two parts. First, there's the resurrection to national life, and then there's a resurrection to spiritual life. The resurrection to natural life is illustrated in verse 12. I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, and uh, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Now, this isn't the bodily resurrection of the saints. This is a national resurrection of a people. And I believe that national resurrection of the nation of Israel took place May 14, 1948, when Israel declared itself to be a nation. After 2,000 years of being out of existence, Israel once again became a nation. That's an amazing thing, that a nation be, that, that didn't exist for 2,000 years would reestablish itself as a nation. And that's significant. But even more significant is what we see in verse 14. I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life. That's the spiritual life of the nation. Israel has become a physical nation again, with a constitution and a president and a prime minister, but they're still not a spiritual nation. They haven't experienced the new birth that uh, is promised in the new covenant. But it is, it is promised here, I will put my spirit within you. I believe that that takes place at the second advent, when Jesus returns and when... The people of Israel will see him whom they pierced. They'll repent, they'll believe, and they'll enter into the blessings of the new covenant. In chapter 37, the last half of the chapter, we see that the two nations, Israel in the north and Judah in the south, they're, they're identified as two sticks that will be brought together. And in the period of the monarch, monarchy, they were divided, the northern kingdom, and the southern kingdom, and they even fought each other. But in the future, they will be reunited under one king. The, the two sticks are brought together. Uh, in Mormon theology, the two sticks are the Bible and the Book of Mormon that are brought together as one authority. But that's not the way the text identifies them. The two sticks represent the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, which are brought together ultimately on one, under one king, King Messiah. Chapters 38 and 39 are chapters that are, are very uh, detailed in terms of a future event, the invasion and destruction of a northern power referred to as Gog, G-O-G. Chapter 38 tells us that in keeping with God's sovereign purpose, Gog, this northern nation, invades Israel and is destroyed. Chapter 39 simply gives us a more detailed account of the destruction and burial of Gog. The big debate among theologians is when is this uh, event to occur? And I would suggest that it occurs at the end of the tribulation period in preparation for the second coming of Jesus. There's a lot of detail here in these two chapters, but this northern kingdom is going to invade, it's going to be destroyed, and all that takes place toward the end of the tribulation period in anticipation of the return of Jesus. Now we come to chapters 40 through 48, and it's a vision of a future temple. Ezekiel has a vision of a future temple. 
And there's a lot of debate about what this temple symbolizes or if it's actually literal. Some say it's a memorial dedicated to the memory of Solomon's temple. Others say this is the actual post-exilic temple the Jews built during the time of their return after Babylon. Others say it's an idealized temple. It's the temple that they should have built. Some even would suggest that it's the heavenly state that Ezekiel is, is describing, or possibly the church age. Some suggest that it's a symbol, a symbol of the messianic age. And then there's a few of us who say, hey, it's a temple. It's measured. It's got gates. It's got a plaza. It's a, it's a temple. And all the details would lead me to that conclusion. If you're interested in further study on this subject of this temple, I'd recommend the book Messiah's Coming Temple by John Schmidt and Carl Laney. Yours truly, we've co-authored this book that actually goes into the details on this temple. But notice that it's described in chapter 43 as a place for sacrifice and the place of Messiah's throne. It's a place of sacrifice and it's a place for Messiah's throne. I believe this temple will be built uh, sometime during the Messianic Kingdom and it will be the place for sacrifice and the place for Messiah's throne. Ezekiel had a view of this temple, possibly from Mount Scopus, a little bit north of the city of Jerusalem, looking down on the city, and he sees this temple. Today you'll see the Dome of the Rock, a Muslim shrine, on the temple platform. But in the future, it might look something like this. The Dome of the Rock will not be there, and instead you'll see a temple on that site. This is perhaps something like the view that Ezekiel had with a temple on the site where the Dome of the Rock is presently located. The thing that troubles us about this temple is the altar. And I'll show you a few slides of the, of the temple. Uh, this is the outer room, the outer court with some rooms surrounding the outer court, perhaps rooms for worship. And then there's actual kitchens in the outer court, which are places where the people's sacrifices can be prepared. And you see the outer court, but there's also an inner court. Uh, inner court surrounded by walls and uh, three gates. The north gate, as you enter into that gate, there's a place for sacrifice. And then in the inner court, you see the main feature is an altar. This is the altar in the inner court. It's a very high altar. And you can see some little sacrifices on that altar. As indicated in the text, this is a place for sacrifice. Uh, these steps lead into the temple itself, the temple proper. And then the priest chambers are on either side of the temple proper with the um, altar out there in the inner court. And Ezekiel says, this is the place of my throne where I will dwell among the sons of Israel forever. As I indicated, um, there is a great deal of interest in the temple among the Jewish people, and uh, they've actually created some of the artifacts that will go into the temple, clothing for the priests, a menorah, and other treasures that will be uh, a a a available for use uh, when the temple is ultimately built. The problem that we have with the temple is the altar. The altar for sacrifices. Sin offerings are to be offered on this altar by the priests, according to chapter 45. And we wonder about this offering. Now, there are people that continue to offer sacrifices, as the Samaritans do. The Samaritans up in the northern part of Israel offer a, an annual Passover sacrifice. Most of us wouldn't really uh, identify with that kind of thing. But I think that the Jewish people and the Messianic Kingdom will identify with that because the sacrifices are such an important part of the Old Testament um, uh, message. I believe that the Old Testament sacrifices pointed ahead to Christ and the ultimate sacrifice that he would accomplish on the cross. The Old Testament sacrifices anticipate what Jesus will do. So, in the Messianic Kingdom, the sacrifices will point back to what Jesus has done. They won't be efficacious. Jesus has completed the sacrificial work that was necessary for our salvation. 
but these sacrifices in the Messianic Kingdom will commemorate. They'll be, kind of be like communion is for us. Communion, we remember what Jesus did. These sacrifices will serve the same purpose of remembering and commemorating what Jesus did on the cross. Not only do we have sacrifices during this Messianic Kingdom, but we have holy days. Pasach or Passover, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, Shabbat, the, uh, the worship on Saturday, and Rosh Hadesh, the new moon. All of these festivals will be celebrated during the Messianic Kingdom, and they will be celebrated because they point to Christ, and Christ is the center of our worship. There will be the tribes that occupy the land during the uh, Messianic Kingdom, and uh, we see a map here that illustrates that the tribal boundaries of the past will be um, not followed, and uh, there is a, a different arrangement for the tribes in Israel during the future Messianic Kingdom. But there's a place for every tribe, and a place for the priests and the Levites, and also for the workers there in the temple. Lessons from Ezekiel. What can we take away from our study of Ezekiel? Well, God is jealous for his own glory. God doesn't want to give his glory to another. And when the people of Judah began to worship these false gods, God's glory departed from Jerusalem. He's jealous for his glory. He doesn't want to give his glory to another. A second lesson is that God is faithful to his covenant people. God's promises to his people will be kept. And uh, he, he will uh, fulfill his promise to bring them back to the land, to bring them into that new covenant. Uh, to give them spiritual blessing and eventually to bring them uh, to a place of worship where Messiah's throne is there in the, in the future temple. And then we conclude that God's temple has a pretty important place in biblical prophecy. We've got eight chapters in the last part of Ezekiel devoted to this temple and, the, and its ministry, so it has an important place in biblical prophecy. Let's take a break and uh, then we'll come back and look at the book of Jeremiah. <laughs> 